at Life Bible Church, it is Life Group Night. And I'm so happy that you guys are meeting together and going through these gifts together. I hope it's been encouraging so far and that we can stay on this course together. And I just want to say as we get into this one, don't stop seeking from God whatever good things He wants to give to you because God's no respecter of persons and He's very generous. And He wants the church to have every gift that it needs in order to be functional and healthy. And tonight, we're going to be looking at one that's very important because it's one that can be given generally. Not that everyone will have it in the fullness of the gift, like that's their main thing, but that we can all walk in this gift, in the, and this is prophecy. So 1 Corinthians 12, 10, to another is given the gift of prophecy, it says. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 gives us this sobering exhortation. It says, do not quench the spirit, whatever you do. If there's a fire burning there and it's the spirit, don't pour water on it. But he says in verse 20, do not despise prophetic utterances. Verse 21, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to what is good. So it doesn't say let everything just run wild without any checks. But it does say that be very careful not to pour water on the gift. And what's the gift in this context specifically? Prophetic utterances. Do not despise prophetic utterances, which would be the same thing as putting out the fire. And so what is it? What is it? What does prophecy do? Prophecy makes us into a mouthpiece for God in the church and in the world, letting us speak and hear expressions from God's heart in an audible voice. And how special is that? And I think about, well, if that's what this is, that God speaks to people, gives us words for each other, you know? A prophet doesn't normally get words for themselves. They get words for somebody else. And that's the interdependence of the body of Christ. So the question that comes to mind for me is, well, what is there to despise then? And I think with all these gifts, we have to always remember, if the scripture cautions us against something like do not despise prophetic utterances, we need to know that we are going to be tempted by the devil, by our own flesh, by our own religiosity to despise it. And we're going to have to be on our guard against it. So what is there to despise? So I want to talk to you about two different ways in which this gift is, is, is generally despised in the church. First, there's the despising of the prophetic word itself. And there's a couple of objections that you hear routinely about prophetic words. One, that word was so general that it could have been for anybody. So that word was so generic that it didn't really reveal any kind of insight. Or, or you hear the word and you go, well, I don't even think that was for me. So that's the first objection that would cause a person to despise a prophetic utterance. Um, and the second one is something that you might call biblical absolutism or something like that. But gen just the idea that we have the scriptures, we don't need these other words from God. And there are whole schools of thought, cessationist schools that are teaching that very thing. That if you've got the Bible, you have the perfect of Romans, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, which that holds absolutely no water um, from, in terms of if you, there's no, there's no clear, there are no lines that connect those two things. Um, so, so we have to be very cautious against, one, despising the word because at, we ourselves cannot value it, and two, despising the word because we say, well, I don't need all this, I have the Bible. So those are two cautions for us to consider. But there's another way that um, the prophetic word is despised, and it's the despising of the prophet himself or herself. And so here, um, I want to address the prophetic personality. Because this is one gift that, generally speaking, has a particular personality, especially when that person has that gift in concentration. It's their main gift. You're going to find a very, in most cases, a unique personality. And the personality can, if, if, not, if the prophet themselves is not careful, they can rub people the wrong way. And it's not God's word that's causing the offense. It's the personality of the prophet. Um, Isaiah, let's, let's think about these people and how they've manifested throughout Scripture. And there is a difference in Old Testament and New. We'll get to that. But look at these prophets. Isaiah preached naked for three years. That's a little off-putting. Let's be honest about that, right? Ezekiel made a model of Jerusalem. He built a model, and then he laid siege to it with his little toy figures and called all the elders of Israel to come and watch him do it. So he basically played army men under God's command on a model of the city. 
but God told him to do it. Jeremiah could hardly preach without weeping, and as far as we know, never made a convert to his point of view. So these are strong personalities. They have, they have a, a, just a uniqueness about them. Um, but what you find is what Isaiah said. He said, I and the children the Lord God has given me are for signs and wonders in Israel. And his point was, our lives are not our own. Uh, my life, nor the, my, my kids' lives, if God wants to use us as a word picture um, to show what his word is to this generation, well, so be it. It's a totally surrendered life. I exist to be a living word to someone else. And that might sound an awful lot like what Jesus is to us, a living word from heaven. So let me tell you about the prophetic personality. The prophetic personality is very black and white. There's not a lot of gray areas for the prophetic personality. There's a lot of right and there's a lot of wrong. There's glorious, wonderful things that God loves and there's awful, terrible things that God hates. And if you try to talk to the prophetic personality about the gray areas, they're just not that much interested in it. The prophetic personality can be very dramatic and impassioned in delivering their message. So the prophetic personality can be off-putting to a more reserved or introspective person. They can, they've got this person praying over you, and they, their voice gets very loud. And maybe they even begin to shout. Maybe they even try to get you to say something. Maybe, you know, they, you never, you just, they start to do it and you're just over here going, whoa, I don't know. I think this person might be crazy, but we're just not used to it. But it's an impassioned personality. The prophetic personality is visual and tactile. So the, they're going to be talking to you about visions. They're going to be talking to you about word pictures. I see a river. I see this. And this is what's happening over here. And there's seven of these and two of those. You see that in the book of Revelation. A monster. Well, that was a vision, I guess you could say. But throughout the, the prophecies, there's pictures. I, there's a tree and there's a garden. And this tree is chopped down and there's a stump. You know, you get these kind of word pictures. But they're tactile. They use things that are just laying around in the room. They'll just pick something up and say, it's like this. And they'll begin to tell you what God's word is for you using something that was just like laying on the dining room table. But that's the prophetic personality. And that can be a little off-putting to a person who's more reserved. But the point of all this is to say, um, we don't despise the word you know, don't kill the messenger, don't despise the word because of the messenger. The prophetic personality can also be, or generally is, uniquely detached from people's opinions. They just don't care what people think. And that actually is what's necessary for them to walk in their gift continually because it can involve a lot of humiliation. I'm just going to go do what God said and we'll find out, you know, hopefully it's the right thing, but I'm, I'm sensing a strong leading to do this, to say this, and they do it. So if we look at 1 Corinthians 14 now, we've been living in 12, visiting 13 about love, and 14 is sort of a follow-on. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 4 says, Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Did you hear that? So he's going to talk about the greater gifts, and prophecy just made that list of the greatest gifts that can be given within the church. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. No one understands. But in his spirit, he speaks mysteries, and he's contrasting tongues and prophecy. Verse 3, but one who prophesies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. We're going to visit those words in just a second. But one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself but one who prophesies edifies the church. So it's a word that's given by God for edification, and what else does he say? Exhortation and consolation. And it's to be sought out and desired at the highest level among all the gifts. So New Testament prophecy, the main functions are edification, exhortation, and consolation. Edification is encouragement. How many people need encouragement? It's the build, it builds you up. You know, it's like laying a foundation so that it can be built on or building on a foundation. Edification is vital. It nourishes something in you that needs to be strengthened so that you can go on. <clears throat> Consolation, or I should say exhortation, is that word that presses you to move forward and to take action. Exhortation is a word of encouragement that says, yeah, get up, do something, take action. That's what exhortation is. 
So a word of prophecy will motivate you to walk in some kind of obedience of faith. And then consolation. Consolation is a word of comfort. You're in a place of hardship, difficulty, and sorrow right now. God wants you to know that he sees it. And he's going to be bringing to your heart a comfort that's going to allow you to then go and comfort others. That kind of a word. So it's a beautiful thing when it's done under the influence of the Holy Spirit and it comes from God and it speaks to the need of the moment. So distinction here quickly because there was prophecy that was done in the Old Testament under the covenant of works and we're talking about primarily prophecy that's done under the covenant of grace and they are not the same. They have similarities and they have some overlap but they are not the same. So Old Testament prophecy, I've already said to you that New Testament was edification, exhortation, and consolation. Well, let me give you the three words most commonly associated with Old Testament prophecy. They're a little different. Ezekiel's handed a scroll by an angel, and it says, When he spread it out before me, it was written on the front and back, and written on it were lamentation, mourning, and woe. So you've got comfort, exhortation, consolation, all these things, and then you've got an edification, and then you've got lamentation, mourning, and woe. And he said when he ate it, it was sweet. And then it turned bitter in his stomach. Well, I guess we shouldn't be surprised. But if you want to understand the fundamental difference, and it's not that there was no comfort, it's not that there was no edification or or any of that in the Old Testament. It was just in a very small measure. Like Jeremiah 29, 11 is a super special verse because it it stands in the midst of, of so much lamentation, mourning, and woe. Whereas the New Testament prophet, when they bring a word to you, it's going to major on the themes of grace. And you can say, praise God for that. So if you got the word wrong under the covenant of works as a prophet, or you changed it, you were declared a false prophet and you had to be stoned to death. But under the new covenant, this new covenant of grace, the word, in a sense, is filtered through the personality of the prophet who is still growing in their gift. And so they can sometimes get an element of the word or even sometimes the whole word is wrong. (laughs) They just felt prompted, but it wasn't God. It was an extra cup of coffee or whatever it was. And they shared something with you and it just wasn't right. Now that's not going to be the norm, but that'll happen sometimes, hopefully rarely. But there's grace in these circumstances rather than condemnation. This does not make them a false prophet if they get it wrong sometimes. So again, humility. The prophet has to exercise humility and say, you know what? That was wrong. I'm sorry. I thought I had an impression from God. I thought it was him. Turns out it wasn't, and I'm sorry. There's times where that has to happen. But but think about what gift is there where, where um, you don't ever have to go back and make something right. It's human reconciliation. As a teacher, um, the gift that I have, I teach, but I I often have to go back and make a retraction and say, well, I know I said that, but you know, I did, that didn't come through right or I said the wrong thing. Um, but it doesn't mean that everything you, else you said was garbage. It just means you're a person whose gift is, who is still growing in their gift. And that's important to remember. So 1 Corinthians 14, 5, Paul says, Now I wish you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. I want it more for you that you would prophesy. And greater is the one who prophesies than one who speaks in a tongue, unless he interprets so that the church may receive edifying. So edification is principle. It's key. You need The church needs to be built up. But he says at the beginning of this, I wish you all spoke in tongues. That's all. And we'll visit that when we come back to tongues in a couple of weeks. Um, but even more that you all would prophesy. So this is a gift we can all walk in. 1 Corinthians 14, 39 says, Therefore, my brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy. He speaks to the group generally and says, You all should desire earnestly to prophesy. And then 1 Corinthians 14, 23 through 25, he explains just exactly what the expression of prophecy can accomplish uh, when it happens under the leading of God's Spirit. And this is powerful. He says, Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're mad? They walk in and everybody's speaking in tongues, but there's no interpretation. He says, that's just kind of, everybody's just going to think you're crazy. But if all prophesy, or an unbeliever or ungifted man enters, they're all prophesying now. He is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. 
The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So it converts the ungifted man, the cessationist, that's what that's talking about. The ungifted man who says, I don't believe in that stuff, well, suddenly his heart is disclosed and he falls on his face and worships God. And you've got the unbeliever who says, I don't even believe in God. And the secrets of his heart are disclosed through prophecy. He falls on his face and worships God. It's powerful. It's a powerful gift uh, used to strengthen and edify the body and used to bring people to Christ. So the part of the body that prophecy serves as, it is the mouth. It's a mouth in the body. These people speak for God for your edification. The tools of this gift are going to be listening prayer. That's important. Not just praying prayer, but listening prayer. Faith, obedience, and boldness, just like we talked about under healing. Faith, obedience, and boldness are going to be tools that you're going to have to employ. But also word pictures and at times visual aids. The strengths of this gift, it convinces people that God is real, that He knows us. It encourages confession and also passionate praise. So those are some beautiful, glorious things that this gift produces. And, but then the weaknesses of this gift, the hang-ups, this personality, as we've talked about already, can be off-putting. The prophet can care too little about people's opinions. It is possible not to care enough and uh, limit their own usefulness just because they don't care. <clears throat> Prophets also tend to have emotional highs and lows depending on how well their gift is received. So they're bringing the word, and if people are receiving it, they're at the heights of glory. And if people are not receiving it, they're in the doldrums of sorrow. So here's your discussion question to get, launch you guys out for tonight. I want you to look up a couple passages, a couple of volunteers, if you would. One, there's, uh, Acts 13.1 will be the first one. The second passage to look up will be 1 Corinthians 12.28, just these two verses. Notice, I want you to notice first, the makeup of the first century church, what the church was composed of, the gifts that were present, and compare it with most churches here in America today. So what special role is prophecy meant to play in a Sunday morning gathering or an evening Bible study, for example, like you're having right now? Why is it so important? And I want to encourage you to share testimonies also to illustrate how this gift has benefited you in the past. So that's the challenge to you. Um, and I would encourage you guys, again, not to forget to set out aside the last portion of your meeting tonight to pray together. Lord bless you guys.